أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن ف 
Let us start this Muharram by sending our salutations to Abu Abdullah al Hussein. Take your hearts to Karbala, place yourselves in Bain al Haramain. And with this grief in your hearts, let us pay our salutations to Mawla Abu Abdullah al Hussein all together. Bismillah. Hello, 
louder, everyone together. Assalamu ala Chagi <laughs> 
तुम मजा खाना सजा के देखना और पंच तन मेहमान खुद होंगे सखी पंच तन मेहमान खुद होंगे सखी फर्श मजलिस का बिछा कर देखना सजा कर देखना अपनी किस्मत आजमा कर देखना तुम मजा खाना सजा कर देखना Inshallah, spend the holy month of Muharram in the best of manner to gain the proximity of Imam Abdullah al-Hussein during this Muharram recital of Allah Salawat wa Muhammad al-Ali Muhammad. أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المأسومين المذلومين واللعنة الله على أعدائهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين وصلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا لفارات الحسين يا حجة الله يا ابن الحسن يا صاحب الأصر والزمان اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وآل My dearest elders, brothers, sisters, salamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Before we start officially, just to reiterate uh, what our dear Noha Khan Sibtain said, this time last year we had some specific individuals in our lives that no doubt would have thought that this Muharram they would be back with us. And one of whom was a pioneer in bringing together these English majalis here in Karachi. Our dear brother Imran Giwala, who from the short time that I had to meet him, I found him to be a very sincere man who really cared about this faith, who really cared about the commemoration and the revival of the Aza of Imam Hussein alayhi salam within the next generation in particular. And due to Allah's infinite wisdom, he called him back. And for all of us, it's a reminder that maybe this will be our last Muharram. But inshallah, in honor of his soul, of all of those souls, of those of our family members who are no longer here with us, for all of our shuhada, for all of our ulama, for all of our marhumin, and especially those who have no one to pray a fatiha for them, I ask you just to take a moment to recite a fatiha for their souls. Rahimallahu man qara al fatiha. And to welcome these days of Aza which we crave and our souls crave in order to find nearness to Allah, I ask you to ease the heart of Sayyid Zahra with the salawat ala Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad. The world, society, and just everyone in general at the moment in 2023 seems to be a little bit confused. Governments are making policies that their people don't even agree with, yet governments are designed to serve their people. Companies are making policies that their employees are not happy about. 
And as Muslims, we're in particular finding this a little bit strange. We're seeing corruption raging when in the heart of man there should be love and mercy. We're seeing oppressive managers when in the heart of a believer this manager should be taking care of their subordinates. We've got discussions about gender that the world hasn't seen before. We've got groups telling us to no longer have families, yet Islam tells us the promotion of family is so critical. We've got some saying spend money with these hedge funds, yet Islam saying be careful of where you spend your money. We've got others saying you can eat this, you can eat that, yet Islam is saying abstain. And at some point, us as Muslims get stuck in the middle. And we're like, what's going on here? Either they're really on a different world or we're on a different world. But there's clearly a polar opposite that's happening. And I feel it's affecting us. We're being pulled into so many identities. We go to school and we're kind of a Muslim. But in the masjid, we're definitely a Muslim. And at the dinner table, we're definitely a Muslim. But at school, we're kind of Pakistani. But in the home, we're definitely Pakistani. Online, who knows what we are? Our parents certainly don't know. And for some of us, we hope it stays that way. Who are we? And why is there so much difference in this world today? So today, we want to try and explore what is one of the causes between these two polar opposite worldviews that is seeing in the world today, between society at large and the Muslim community trying to hold strong. And we'll conclude that the main cause is the why behind everything that we do. And once we establish this why, we're going to realize there's two different whys at play. Why is in W-H-Y. There's a why of those who don't believe, and there's a why of those who do believe. And we're going to dig into Islam's why. Why does Islam have this why? And you're probably going to have a count as to how many times I say why today. Don't ask why. And we're going to try and see what a world would look like if we were to truly adopt as societies, as businesses, as communities, as families, Islam's purpose. What could the world look like if we took it on board? And we'll finally conclude once we're so inspired that it's really not easy to hold on to this purpose and this why. And that is the reason for our jihad al-akbar in this world. So if you'd like to go on this journey together, kindly offer a salawat ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Society one says, yes, it's safe, put your money in this institute. Islam turns around and says, be mindful. Why? Behind any action that we complete, it's important that we understand that there is a reason for why we've done that action. Take a simple example. Zaid goes and buys a pizza. You now interview Zaid as he comes out of the pizza shop and you're like, Zaid, how come you went to purchase this pizza? He says, I was hungry and I found that to, cure this, to get this hunger alleviated, the best way that I found today was to buy this pizza. Okay, the why drove him to buy this pizza. In another example, Zaid says, I'm gonna go to medical school. So after Zaid goes in and puts his application into the university, he comes out, he says, Zaid, come to the side, let me have a quick chat. What's the purpose behind this decision that you've made? And he says, ah, I wanna help people. I feel I'm good at biology. I feel I'm good at chemistry. I feel that I care about people and I want to try and put this all together and I want to become a doctor. And I also want to make some money on the side as well in doing so. Every action, every decision, anything that we do, be it you guys attending these majalis tonight on the first night of Muharram if the moon is to be found inshallah, to what you eat at night, to your career, to how you react to your spouse, to the spouse that you may be looking for, is driven by a reason. And that reason we're calling today the why. Therefore, there is vital importance for us to understand what our why is. What is it that is driving our day-to-day -day decisions? Let's take another example as to how this can turn a little bit more sour. We enter this masjid and you and I, we find a hundred pounds on the floor. The British pound is back up against the dollar, finally. We're getting there. The Queen's revolution is back, I'm kidding, okay. So we find 100 quid on the floor. No one's looking. 
In episode one, it's just me and the hundred pounds. What do I do? I take it, put it in my pocket, walk off, pretend as if nothing's happened. In episode two, you see the money. No one's watching, you see it and you're like, ooh. Let me hold on to it. Let me put a message out. Let me see if anyone lost that cash. And if no one's lost that cash, I'm gonna ask an alim, what do I do when I find money that's not mine? And you'll find an answer to it because Islam has an answer for everything. Two very different actions given the same scenario. Your action, you stood there, you pondered, you thought, you were like, actually, hold on, if I take this money, there's going to be a day where I'm going to be held accountable for this. I know it's not mine. I know there's an all-seeing creator that is watching my every move, and that's going to catch up with me one day. But for me, no, my arrogance got the better of me. I don't care about this day. I don't care about this Lord. I don't care whether he exists, whether he can see me or whatever. I want a hundred quid. I've taken it, and it's going to go fund my Land Cruiser one day. May have to get a few more hundred quids to get a Land Cruiser with the prices that they've reached now. You see two different whys at play and they influence two different actions. One why is a cognizance of God, is a cognizance, an understanding that there is an all powerful and all wise creator watching you. The other one was nothing more than me just having a desire for a Land Cruiser, for a car. Two different whys, two different actions. My why devoid of anything interesting, just personal ego. Your why full of accountability, wariness that something's there. My theory, or I guess the theory generally is, society today is massively devoid of this why, this greater why, this accountability, this awareness that there is something greater than you watching your every move that will hold you to account one day, whether in private or in public, your every move will be assessed. And therefore what we're finding is we as Muslims are trying to make godly decisions. That's what's driving our actions. But society is saying, nah, forget it, man. Enjoy your life. Why do you need to be so worried about this creator? You get another YouTube short that comes and says religion restricts you. You're like, yeah, I agree. Religion's restricting me. What's the big deal? And then the next reel comes up and now it's a scholar saying, be careful of the day of judgment. You're like, oh man, which reel do I listen to? This one or that one? One is filled with a greater purpose, one is absent. Society doesn't feel any accountability, I feel some accountability. And we're stuck in the middle. We're stuck every single time with this decision. Do I go towards a godly decision? Or do I pander towards something that is kind of lacking any real purpose? Salah time comes, you're like, do I pray, do I not pray? Society doesn't care. But for some reason, there's something in me that's telling me to care. But so what? So what? There's two different approaches. Why are you making such a big deal out of this? Two different approaches. What's the difference? If we boil down these two different approaches into the following way, the godly Islamic way is all about something centric. It's God centric. The societal norm right now is self centric. It's all about me. It's all about my land cruiser. It's all about what I want. It's about my fame. It's about what makes me look good. But the God-centric version is very, very different. The God-centric version is full of accountability. A mindset that includes a greater authority that looks over you will make a huge difference in your life and now in society because you're pulled towards a better decision every single time. You're constantly finding that which is perfect, not that which is imperfect. Let me spell it out a little bit more. Would you rather go and find a spouse who's full of deceit and lies or one full of truth and wisdom? Only a rational person would say, I prefer the one that is truthful. And only an irrational person would say, I can't wait to marry a cheater. This has always been my dream. Would you rather be taught by someone who is absolutely perfect and has been raised in a perfect way? Or would you rather be taught by someone who's made a million mistakes and continues to make mistakes today? The why behind your decision has massive impacts on your actions and what comes after. Now here's another layer how it gets even more confusing. Because in the example that we've given, we've got the why of society that says, 
just do what you want. We've got the why of, of the religion which says, focus on Allah. Now we've got society whose why changes every other second of the day. A hundred years ago, they said you can't have this type of marriage. Now they're saying you can have this type of marriage. A hundred years ago, they said this is called pedophilia. Now we're starting to see, oh, maybe we need to make a term for this to make it accepting. Society's why is changing by the day, by the second. Yet Islam's why has remained the same since Adam alayhi salam. No difference. In one scenario, Joe sees the money. Poor Joe. I'm just going to pick on Joe. It's nothing against a guy called Joe. And if any of you guys are named Joe, we'll name you Yaqub instead maybe. I don't know. Poor man Joe, he sees that same hundred quid. And on Monday he says, yeah, I need that for my land cruiser. The next day he sees the hundred quid and he goes, actually, I'm going to give it to charity. MashaAllah. The next day he says, actually, I'm going to need it for the Land Cruiser. The next day he's like, actually, I'm going to give it to my parents. He has no moral compass that is showing him, this is what you do in every eventuality. This is what you do in every situation. With a constantly changing why, imagine this. You're trying to fly from Karachi to Dubai. And for the first 10 minutes of your journey, you're saying, my purpose is to get to Dubai. Great, you're going in the right direction. 10 minutes later, your purpose is to go to Abu Dhabi. So you change slightly. 10 minutes later, you say, no, I'm going to go back to Karachi. So you do a U-turn. 10 minutes later, you say, I'm going to now head to Mumbai. So now you're going in a completely different direction. No logical person would say that your why should change within you. They would only say, keep a consistent focus. Whether it be right or wrong, keep a consistent focus. And Islam is saying from Adam until Khatim, your focus is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nothing else. Towards supreme perfection and nothing else. And if this is making sense so far and if I've not sent you all to sleep, kindly offer salawat ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Islam teaches us a beautiful why. Qurbatan ilallah. Go get closer to God. Go increase your ma'rifah of God, your understanding of God. Go and worship God through your actions, through your ibadah. It's constantly around a godly theme, which is why whenever you see any of the imma or any of the righteous companions or the awliya of Allah, they're one and the same brush. You won't find a difference between them. They're absolutely aligned. We spoke about this last day. If you want to understand what the revolution of our awaited savior will look like, look no further than the revolution of our holy prophet. They're from the exact same purpose, the exact same why. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it very clear to us about what this why is in the Quran. In a verse that many of you will find familiar, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That we haven't created you, I did not create the jinn, or the humans and the humans except that they worship me. And there's a massive discussion about what ya'budun, what this worship is. But for argument's sake, let's say it's every single decision that you make can be worship. When I go and massage my mother's feet, that is worship. When I go and sit on the musalla, that is worship. When I attend the majalis of Hussein, that is worship. When I don't take that hundred pounds and ensure it goes to the rightful owner or follow the guidance of the sharia, ah, that is worship. All of this is ya'budun, is worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it calibrates decisions. You start to see consistency. And within it, you do something very important that society is struggling with today. And that is the key differentiator between Islam and postmodern society. What is that? In all of those decisions where we said you attend the measures of Hussein, or you return that money, or you massage your mother's feet. None of it is about you. It's all about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your nearness to him. Whereas society, it was about my land cruiser. It was about my fame. It was about people being interested in me. It was about my followership. It's the God centricity versus the me centricity. Your opinion changes by the day like Joe. So you'll be all over the place. You'll see your life collapsing 
You'll see followership one day, hatred the next. And many of us are making this mistake. We're being faced with decisions every day. We know the Islamic way that is godly, that is infinite. And we know the societal norm that will get us that traction. And we have this jihad within us where our soul pulls towards God and then pulls towards shaitan and pulls back towards God and back to shaitan. And we're going back and forth, back and forth. And the dice seems to roll and we end up on shaitan's time once, twice, three times, ten times. Then we're like, why am I making these decisions? And then in Shah Ramadan comes the Layal of Qadr. And we read these a'mal telling us, reflect on yourself, reflect on yourself. And we're so defensive, we're like, no, 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 it's not me. It's society, I blame society. You made the decision, I made the decision. Who else can I go to? But I want to come back to this point that we started with. Society is going all over the place. Is truly the difference just this why? Is that all it is? Is that all that's at play? Now, there's many factors, but I would argue at the, at the crux of it, it's this. Ya'budun is at the crux of the difference. A Muslim society illustrates a group of people who are solely focused on doing haq, the perfect, correct thing. Tell me, if there was a society today, if there was a society today where every single person in that society had taqwa and was following this concept of ya'budun, of worshipping Allah, would you ever find a single murder in that society? Would you ever find a single theft? Would you ever find a single illegitimate relationship? Would you ever find an issue of fame? Would you ever find an issue of poverty? Or you choose society's version which has shown itself in all its glory over the last however many centuries and millennia that it's failed, failed again, and failed again. And now in any government that you look at today, probably failing again. So what does it take for this Ya'budun to be instilled within us, to be part of this perfect society? Three, fa three concepts. Firstly, you need this sincerity in your belief system. Secondly, you need it in your ethics, in your akhlaq. And finally, your belief system matched with your epic, matched with your epic, with your ethics will manifest into your actions. All three are necessary. And to apply a layer of sincerity onto your belief system, you need to spend time studying your belief system. More time maybe than you study your own profession because your profession will die with you but your belief system will travel with you forever. But society's got us in a twisted way. It's telling us focus on the education solely and neglect religion on the side. Islam has come to say no, focus on your belief system and through your belief system you'll find rizq in the way that you study and understand and become a value to society. It flips it. How many of us became doctors? Sorry for those of you who are doctors in the room, I wasn't clever enough. So I'm not even going to pretend that I can be on that level, okay? But how many of us became doctors because of the fame it would give us rather than the worship of Allah it would allow us to do? It's as subtle as this in our decision making. But what is this sincerity? Khalis. Khulus. Ikhlas. Familiar words for you guys. It's something absolutely pure that is not mixed with anything else. The opposite of something that is khalis, you could describe to be a curry. It's mixed with absolutely everything. Anything under the sun. Something that is khalis is absolutely pure of anything except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you work day and night trying to unpick it, trying to unpick it, clarify my intention, try this. It's absolutely khalis when it's only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Khalis opposes something that we call in Arabic, riya, pretentiousness. Pretentiousness is at the moment, I think, the buzzword within some social circles. That, oh my God, she's so pretentious. Oh my God, he's so pretentious. Look how he's showing off. Look how she's showing off. 
You've got an individual who is sincere, who is khalis, and you have an individual who is pretentious, who is showing off, who is trying to show his shoulders, trying to show their beauty, trying to show off their followership, and they're two opposite sides of the coin. Society is trying to pull us towards something that is all about showing off. Show what you've got. Islam is saying, be khalis. Now can you see why we feel stuck in the middle? Because our aql is telling us, go towards that which is sincere, but our desires is telling us, go towards that which is opposite. Now just imagine a world without riya. Imagine a world without any pretentiousness. Rather than spending a few hundred million or even tens of billions and dare I say hundreds of billions on brand new cities to make our countries look like the global center of the earth, we'd perhaps start by solving world hunger. It would be as simple as that, right? If this individual or these group of individuals just controlled their egos and said, you know what? Let's not build another tower that's empty without any offices taken up, without any flats taken up. But hey, it looks nice in the sky and it flashes at night. Let me actually go and use this money to serve the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Instead of another war for power to gain more oil for our country we'd perhaps take to more diplomatic dialogue to fulfill the needs of our people in a correct way, in a loving way, in a way that's taught by Amir al-Mu'mineen to Malik. The moment you remove riya from society, you have a very different looking society, do you not? The moment you remove, the moment you remove riya, pretentiousness, showing off arrogance from your family, you have a very different family contract, do you not? The moment you move, remove riya from your relationship with your spouse, you find many, much fewer arguments and much more love. And the moment you remove riya and pretentiousness from your obedience to Allah, you'll recognize what obedience to Allah actually is. You'll find happiness. You'll find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within this. Can you offer salawat ala Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad? But why is society so pulled towards this showing off? Why is it that I'm just desperate to post on Insta and as soon as Facebook says we've got threads, I have to make a threads account straight away? I'm really eager to check it out by the way, I'm not going to lie, but for now I'll pretend as if I'm against it, just to keep the show, you know? There's goodness in each of these platforms, but there's danger in each of these platforms. You know it, I know it, we all know it, we've all made mistakes. If you remove, if you look at an individual and understand why I am looking and craving to be so strong and broad-shouldered, usually it boils down to someone coming to the end of the lecture and patting me on the back and saying, Sadiq, good job, good job. And I'm like, yeah, good job, I did it. It was me. I just want this little bit of love, little bit of praise, little bit of something coming at me just to make me feel better. Just to get me through, not even the week, maybe just the night, and then the next day I'll need to post something else to get another like, and another one, and another one, and it just keeps on going. Why? Why do we turn towards something finite to get satisfaction, knowing full well that it's finite, and the next day, I'm going to need more of it. Why not go to the one that's infinite? That can give me infinite levels of satisfaction. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it clear. He says, it is He who created the heavens and the earth in six days. And His throne was then upon the waters that He may test you to see which of you is in the best of conduct. You're probably thinking, what's that got to do with this discussion? Our holy Sikh Imam Imam Ja'far and his Sadiq Salawatullahi wa Salamahu alayhi Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad He was asked about this verse and he's reported to say Laysa ya'ni akthara amalan walakin aswabakum amala It doesn't mean abundant in actions it's not about how many actions you're doing. It's not about how many salat al layls that you've done. It's not about how many ziyarat that you've done. It's not about how much charity that you've given that Allah is seeing. How much did you do? How much did you do? What volume did you do? 
Imam Sadiq's reported to say, it does not mean abundant actions, rather it means the sincerest actions. Hur case in point. It's not the volume and the classic phrase, it's not quantity, it's quality. Allah wants to check. I made all of this for you. I made all of this for you to see your sincerity according to Imam al The great scholar and slave of Allah, Allama Qadi, who many of you will be familiar with. There's a book, actually, a really nice book. It's very, very thin, like 80 pages or something, really small. Split up into about 100 different anecdotes from his students and those who are around him discussing what he was like as an individual. And one of the contributors narrates this story about Allah Maqadi, where we'll get an understanding for this concept of sincerity versus quantity, versus just doing an act of obedience because you want some fame out of it. The man says, one night as usual, I woke up for Salat al-Layl. You're probably thinking, wow, what a nice way to begin. How can this guy do something wrong? Salat al-Layl, when was the last time I woke up for Salat al-Layl? One night as usual, I woke up for Salat al-Layl. However, on this occasion, I felt a strange tiredness. He said, I just didn't feel that I could pray in this state. And you know, we all have it. Fudge your time, blanket off, blanket on, blanket off, blanket on. Roll over, snooze the alarm again. Check when qada is, I've got 15 minutes left. Then the panic at the last second and you get up and get to the bathroom. He's having that moment. Suddenly, he says, a beautiful angel appeared in front of me while I was in this state of doubt and uncertainty whether I should offer my night prayer. And upon seeing the beauty of this angel, all that tiredness and that fatigue that I had vanished. Khalas. I got out of bed, did my wudu, and made the night prayer. In the morning, he went to see Allah Maqadi, and he told him what had happened. Imagine, he goes to Allah Maqadi and tells him, this is what happened, I saw this angel, I wasn't feeling so good, but I ended up doing Salat al Allah Maqadi looks at him, remains silent for a little bit. He says, strange. It seems that you're still attached to the form. So when do you intend to reach the meaning and the essence? What a weird thing to say. It seems like you're attached to the form. So when do you intend to reach the meaning and the essence? I.e. it seems that you were more attached to the concept of Salat al-Layl than you were with the why behind your Salat al-Layl. What was your Salat al-Layl for? What was the why behind Zaid going to medical school? What was the why behind you buying the Land Cruiser? What was the why behind you buying the pizza? What was the why behind your Salat al-Layl? Was it to do Salat al-Layl just for the sake of doing it? Was it to turn up to the house of the next day to say to your friend, oh, how was your evening? I'm really tired, ask me why. Ask me why. All 11 units, bro. And I remember you in my prayers. Second, actually. Were you doing it for Salat al-Layl? Or were you doing it to reach the real meaning and essence of Salat al-Layl? Which is Ya'budun. To truly being in a state of Ubudiyya. To find this perfect Lord of yours. The contributor continues and he says the Sayyid would also emphasize not paying attention to these illuminations and unveilings when you're trying to get closer to Allah. He would constantly say, give your heart to God and pay attention to nothing except Allah. For everything other than Allah will be annihilated. You want the like? The person that gave you the like will be annihilated. You want the praise of your son, your son will be annihilated one day. You want the praise of your mother, even your mother will be annihilated one day. I.e. at some point, everything in this earth will fold up. And the only thing that you would really want the attention of is the only thing that remains to exist, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Maqadi continues, except him, nothing else is worthy of being given the heart. 
when praying or supplicating ignore the beauty of anything that you see or hear and give all of your attention to Allah's beauty to his jamal to his absolute splendor God forbid for the sake of the heaven you become heedless of its creator and many of us struggle with this in the simpler things like social media and in the tougher things like even in our prayers am I prolonging my prayer because they're seeing me it's this level of purity and sincerity that we're aiming for because the primary goal of religion to create this society that we discussed where you have these amazing individuals that work together in such a harmonious way the primary goal of religion According to Amir al Mu'mineen, al ikhlasu ghayatu deen. That sincerity is the ultimate goal of religion. And he's also reported to say, al ikhlasu a'la al iman. That sincerity is the highest level of faith. Those who manage to achieve these highest levels of faith, it's because everything that they've done is absolutely khalis, it is completely pure. It's not like my ibadah that's full of curry, full of spices, full of this, full of that. It's absolutely pure with just Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's tough. It's tough. This is utopia. This is the north star that we're aiming for. This is why Allah gave us the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt alayhi wasalam, to see how they did it so we can try. It requires massive focus, dedication, real conviction that you want to do this. Especially in a society that is telling you, no, 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 chill out. Go be a celebrity. You know what? It's 8 p.m. You're on your phone at home. Go become an influencer tonight. I'll give you six quick tips to become an influencer and to make your first 100,000 this year. We've all had these, man. If it's not Forex trading, then it's going to be a product that you can sell on Amazon. Then it can be something else. And you're like, damn, these guys are constantly going for me. Islam pulls me towards becoming khalis. The world is pulling me towards becoming an ego freak. Our dear eighth Imam, Gharib al Ghuraba, Imam al Ridha, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi, Allahumma salla ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad wa jafraja. And I think in honor of him and in honor of the one who he narrates from, none other than Amir al-Mu'mineen, we can offer a salawat that is truly full of wilaya. Aflaha man salla ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Imam al-Ridha narrates from Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhim as He's reported to say, all of the world is ignorance. Pay really close attention to this hadith. It gets a bit confusing, but the conclusion is fast. All of the world is ignorance, except the places of knowledge. All knowledge is an argument against the human, i.e. anyone who has knowledge, you'll be held against it. Did you act to that knowledge? Except that which is acted upon. All actions are riya, they're all ostentation, they're all pretentious, they're all showing off, except the act that is performed with ikhlas, with sincerity. And then what does he say? The key point. And sincerity is vulnerable to danger until the servant sees the end of his actions. Wow. You could work so hard to make sure that no one knows about your salat al layl That your wife or your husband doesn't know about your salat al layl that you go to sleep early enough that you don't even need an alarm. You manage to get up. You get out of the blanket so quietly. You shut the door. You go to another room. You come back into bed. And they don't even know that you've got out of bed. You've had the best of in their intentions. You've executed it so well. Amir al muminin says, sincerity is vulnerable. You're doing really well. But it's vulnerable. Until you see the end of your action. When is the end of the action? Is it as soon as I finish that salah? When I get back into bed, I'm good. I wake up in the morning and I have this big grin on my face. I've done it. I've done it. I've done it. Sincerity is vulnerable. I've done it. I've managed to do a completely sincere salah to layl. I've done it. I've done it. I've done it. Why?
are you so happy today? Oh, what do I say? What do I say? What do I say? What do I say? Until you've closed that chapter, your sincerity is vulnerable, according to Amir al-Mu'mini. And there's a really beautiful point hidden within this. It's just fascinating when you think about how God-centric we've been made to be. You're trying so hard to make this so sincere. You know you want it to be a success. You're doing your utmost, utmost. You're focusing, you're focusing. At some point, you can feel that ego within you wanting to say something. Who can you turn to in order to get help to make sure it stays sincere? None other than the one who you're trying to find in the first place. It's to you alone that I worship. And it's to you alone that I ask for help. Oh Allah, I'm doing this to find you, to get closer to you, to become an abd of you and help me in doing so. Because without your help, I can't even do this. Ya ayyuhal nas, O people, antumul fuqara'u ilallah. You're absolutely needy in a state of poverty unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam al-Sadiq reported to say, to persist on an action until it is sincerely performed is harder than the action itself. Salat al-Layl was the easy part, but holding it secret between you and Allah was the tough part. You can pledge to give 5K, 50K, 500K to charity. But how long can you hold on to that secret between you and Allah? Imagine this. There's a day that comes where you're on your deathbed and there's even one deed that you've done that no one in the world knows about except you and Allah. And you've kept it secret that entire time. What kind of reward Allah has in store for you? What kind of meeting with Allah will you have? Giving charity was the easy part. Keeping it sincere was the tough part. And this is a lifelong journey. This is exactly what we're up against. We want that. But society is telling us, go in a different way, go in a different way, go in a different direction. But what makes this particularly tough is when our belief in the reward that Allah will give us is weak. Is when our belief in the fact that there is a day where I'll be held accountable, both good and bad, if our belief in that day is weak, it's very difficult to live for that. It's like telling a child, go revise, go revise, go revise. But mom, there's no exam and there's no results day. Yeah, but go revise. Why should I, resi why should I revise if there's no exam and there's no results, results day? Why should I bother being sincere in my action if I don't even believe in Yawm Al-Qiyamah? What's the point? Or if my belief in Yawm Al-Qiyamah is weak? Or if my belief in Allah is weak? If I know there's this special day where I'm going to open an envelope and see which university I got into. If I know there's going to be a day where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the angels to say this door or that door, metaphorically speaking. Then yeah, I'm going to really strong, try hard to hold on to this deed of mine. But if I don't have that belief, if I don't believe in the unseen, if I don't believe in the ghayb, if I don't believe in Allah, if I don't believe in the day of judgment, khalas. I believe more in the notification than I do in the day of judgment. I believe more in the person giving me a pat on the back and a nice message than I do in Allah saying, this was one of my sincere slaves who I now wish to reward. Beautiful in the Quran. Surah Al-Ikhlas, i.e. sincerity. Surah Al-Tawheed. Seven chapters before it. Surah Al-Fil, 105, through to Surah number 111. Talk about the various hostilities of the polytheists and the disbelievers against the Holy Prophet and Islam. Seven chapters before, all about be careful. And then Surah Tawheed comes. This is your solution on how to be careful. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Qul huwallahu ahad. For those of you who are interested in tafsir of Quran, go to Al-Mizan. They have an online platform now where some of it's been translated. And there's a section called Discourses. Click on Discourses and click on Tawheed. And look at the way that this grand scholar discusses Tawheed. Phenomenal. Sincerity. How much depth there is behind it. Surah Al-Ikhlas is your answer if you're struggling with this 
Ria with this pretentiousness. Study Surah Al Ikhlas, focus on it. But in particular, focus on this last verse that we find. If you're struggling with this part where you do a deed and you really need someone's attention, remember this last verse of Surah Al Ikhlas. And there is no one comparable to him. When you feel that need to share that deed, to show off, to get that praise, remember that there is no one comparable to him. Remember that there will be no satisfaction greater than what he can give you. Remember that there will be no one to give you that satisfaction eternally except the one that is eternal. There is nothing like him. So now intellectually, do I care about the like or do I care about infinite likes? If your bubble is encouraging you towards followership and fame, then that could be the root cause. And we'll discuss this in the coming nights, inshallah, if Allah grants us the time and risk to do so. So to conclude, when we look at the dilemmas that society faces today, I ask the question to you to reflect on and maybe discuss when you get home. How many of these dilemmas could be solved if every individual had true sincerity in their actions? Even if atheism could be proven true, which is an oxymoronic statement in of itself, but we won't go into that now. Even if atheism could be proven true, would it create a more prosperous world than a godly, sincere world? Impossible. And just look at how much you value and I value the creation of Allah's attention over the Creator's attention. And see what it feels like to hold on to that deed. And remember, Amir al Mu'mineen and Imam al Sadiq were telling you it is difficult. It's designed to be difficult. It's designed to see how far you can go with it. Nabi Musa alayhi salam once requested to Allah, O oh Lord, it is my wish to see that creature of yours who has purified himself for your worship and who is unpolluted in his obedience towards you. Now you're probably thinking, maybe this is like one of those prophet and then Allah says, here's Imam Hussein or whatever. No, it goes in a bit of a different fashion. So your attention on this one. Who could this or what could this creation be? Prophet Musa was addressed. Oh Musa, go near the shores of such and such sea in order that I may show you what, desire, what you desire to see. Prophet Musa alayhi salam, he proceeds until he reaches near the sea. He looks around and he observes and notices that there's a branch of a tree that's drooped over the water and there's a bird that sat there, engrossed in the remembrance of Allah. When Prophet Musa questioned the bird about itself, tell me about yourself. The bird said, from the time Allah has created me, I have been on this branch engaged in his worship and remembrance. From every remembrance of mine, there branch out a thousand other remembrances. And the pleasure which I derive from the remembrance of Allah provides me with more nourishment. Nabi Musa startled. He asked him, do you crave anything from this world? The bird replies, yes. I yearn to taste one drop of water from this sea. Prophet Musa exclaims, but there's not a great distance between where you are and the sea. You're sat on a branch that's drooping over the sea and you've got wings. Just go and have a taste of it. Why don't you dip your beak in and drink? The bird answers, out of fear, lest the enjoyment derived from the water should make me heedless of the pleasure of the remembrance of my Lord. One taste into this material world can take us away from the immaterial, infinite, supremely perfect Lord. This is sincerity. This is purity. I don't want anything that is finite when I can access something that is infinite. I'm not interested. That's all I'm after. 
And of course, we also have individuals who had completely unpolluted, absolutely pure and sincere hearts. And for one of those individuals, all of you in this room today decided, tonight I'm coming to his majalis. And that is none other than the dear grandson of the Prophet, Abi Abdullah al Hussein, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. But look, we need to ask ourselves a really tough question here. Last year, you can remember it very well. Usually in Muharram, you can remember the year before quite clearly where it was, where you were, which majalis you attended, how you were as an individual. All of those memories come back. Genuine question on this topic of sincerity within majalis. How much of my mourning last year, how much of my aza, of my tears, was truly sincere? I'm coming to a man who is truly sincere. I want to try and be truly sincere. But when I mourn him, my sincerity is mixed with trying to show off to others as to look how much I cried. Look how little you cried. Look how much of a lover of Imam Hussein that I am. Look how much tabarak I gave. Let me make sure you know that I distributed the cakes. This is a tough battle. But imagine what one sincere tear for a sincere man that is adored by Allah could do for you on Yawmul Qiyamah. You know what sincerity looks like versus society today? Anyone that is attending the majlis of Aba Abdul Al Hussein alayhi salam tonight or in any of the coming 10, 12, 60 nights that we're about to remember and mourn him and the family of Ali Muhammad. Tell me, have any of them been stopped at the door and said, tell me your wealth level? Because depending on your wealth level, that's how you can come in. Depending on your ethnicity, then you can come in or you can't come in. Depending on your academic level, then you can come in or you can't come in. Depending on how many sins you've committed, you can come in or you can't come in. Every single individual, no matter what we have done for the last 300, 350, 365 days, the door of Hussein welcomes you back to the ship of salvation. You have all been written to be here this evening and you have enacted upon this. You are amongst the lovers of Sayyid Zahra and Abi Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam tonight, and it could be the last night. It could be that very last night that we have to shed a tear on Imam Hussein, because maybe tonight on the way home it could be the end. So, on this first night of Aza, as we enter the Masa'ib, I ask you to cast your heads down, to try and tap into your soul. And to offer your condolence to Imam Al Hussein with a salawat ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. On this night, as we're welcome into the University of Hussein, we remember Hussein being welcomed into the arms of Rasulullah as he would bid farewell to Medina Al Munawwara. As night would fall, Hussein alayhi salam went to the mosque of the Holy Prophet to bid him farewell. He went to Rasulullah's grave and when he reached the grave, he saw a light emanating from it. And so out of respect, he returned back. What that light was, I don't know. On the next night, he goes back again to bid farewell to his grandfather, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He stands in prayer for a long time. And whilst he goes into prostration, Hussein alayhi salam goes into a sleep and the Prophet would come into his dream. And the Prophet in his dream of Hussein would hug Hussein to his chest. Why to the chest, O Rasulullah? He would kiss him between his eyes. Why between his eyes, Rasulullah? And he would say, Bi'abi enter. May my father be sacrificed for you. 
Rasulullah to his grandson, may my father be sacrificed for you. Why? Rasulullah is reported to say, Ka'anni araka murammalam bidamika bayna isabatim min hadhi l-umma. It is as if I see you drenched in your own blood lying before a group from this nation. They will seek my intercession. But God will deny them any share of it. You are coming towards your father, your mother, and your brother. What does Hussein have to do to get there? Johnson, you have a station in paradise that cannot be attained. Narrations even tell us that from birth, even aged one, but even this one where he was aged two, that when Hussein completed two years of his life, the Prophet went on a journey. Along the way, the Prophet stopped and he was heard to recite, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. And his eyes would fill with tears and they would ask him, Why? Why did you suddenly say this verse? Rasulullah is reported to say, Here is Jibra'il. He is informing me about a land at the banks of Euphrates. There is a land at the bank of Euphrates called Karbala. My son Hussein, the son of Fatima, will be killed there. Someone asked him, Oh Rasulullah, who will kill him? He replied, A man by the name of Yazid, may Allah curtail his life. It is as if I can see the place where he shall fall and where he shall be buried and his head shall be carried away as a trophy by Allah. No one shall gaze at the head of my son Hussein and be pleased except the one whose tongue has been separated from his heart. Ya Allah, allow us to make our tears and our aza and our mourning on these nights that you have granted us the opportunity to see truly sincere. And O oh Allah, we ask you on this night that when we're struggling to keep this truly sincere, to remind us to come towards you to ask you to help us to keep them sincere, insha'Allah. And oh Allah, allow us through all of the tears and all of the times we beat our chest in these nights, that even just one second of it to be truly sincere, such that it may please your dear lady, Zahra alayhi salam. I ask you, as we asked you last year, that when we conduct the azar of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, it should be done with the correct adab, with the correct approach the correct behavior and that is this that if you were to have lost a loved one and if someone were to be reciting a poem about your loved one that you would not move from that hall until it's finished you wouldn't dare to move from that hall until it's finished you would sit in the most respectful manner and engage in the most respectful way of Hussein can ignite a new layer of love and purity in your heart And when you hear someone else cry, maybe it will allow that hardened heart of mine to begin trembling and eventually ask forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So with the salawat, I ask you to stand and to be ready for the aza of Hussein Sayyid al-Shuhada aflaha man salla ala Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad.
يا حسين 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 يه مجلس ماتم هوگا حسين يا حسين حسين يا حسين حسين يا حسين حسين يا حسين جان رہے يا جائے يه مجلس ماتم هوگا حسين يا حسين حسين يا حسين حسين يا حسين حسین حسین یا حسین گھر بار بھلے لٹ جائے یہ غم نہ کبھی کم ہوگا حسین یا حسین حسین یا حسین حسین یا حسین حسین یا حسین یا حسین یا حسین سارے مل کے بولند آواز اسے حسین یا حسین یا حسین أما فزا بتا دے مجھ کو پتھر کیوں آ رہے ہیں کیسا ہے یہ چراغا دل ڈوبے جا رہے شام آ گیا ہے ام فیضا بتا دے مجھ کو پتھر کیوں آ رہے ہیں ام فیضا بتا دے مجھ کو پتھر کیوں آ رہے ہیں سارے مل کے بلند آوازوں سے ام فیضا بتا دے مجھ کو پتھر کیسا ہے یہ چراغا دل ڈوبے جا رہے ہیں کیا شام آ گیا ہے ہم فضا بتا دے مجھ کو پتھر کیوں آ رہے ہیں ہم فضا بتا دے مجھ کو پتھر ہونے لگی آزانے کیسے سروں کو ڈاپے بازو بند ہوئے گئے خون رو رہی ہے آنکھیں آنکھوں کے خون سے رستے خون میں ناغا رہے کیا شام آ گیا ہے ہم فضا بتا دے مجھ کو پتھر کیوں آ رہے مولا آپ سب کو سلامت رکھیں ہم فضا بتا دے مجھ کو پتھر کیوں آ رہے ہیں ہم فضا بتا دے مجھ کو پتھر سجاد کا کلے جا صد پاش ہو رہا گئے ایک ایک زخم ان کا اس غم میں رو رہا گئے زینب کا نام لے کر زینب کا نام لے کر آدھا بھلا رہے ہیں کیا شام آ گیا ہے ہم فضا بتا دے مجھ کو پتھر کیوں آ رہے ہیں ہم فضا
नेजों पे जितने सर है एक सर है उनमें ऐसा आंखें हैं बंद उसकी हर खाक पर है गिरता अब्बास का ये सर तेवर बता रहे क्या शाम आ गया है नेजों पे जितने सर हैं एक सर है उनमें ऐसा आंखें हैं बंद उसकी और खाक पर गे गेता बस का वो सर गए तेवर बता रहे हैं क्या शाम व गया है हम मफिजा बता दे मुझे को पत्थर क्यों आ रहे हैं हम मफिजा बता दे सारे मिलके थर क्यों आ रहे हैं अम्मा फिजा बता दे मुझे को ए है इतना चले हैं पैदल कांटों पे सारे कैदी इतना चले हैं पैदल कांटों पे सारे कैदी थक जाती चलते चलते चलती अगर जमी भी पैरों के अब ले भी आंसू बगा रहे हैं क्या शाम आ गया है हम मफिजा बता दे मुझे को पत्थर क्यों आ रहे हैं हम मफिजा बता दे मुझे को पत्थर क्यों आ रहे हैं हम मफे बता दे मुझे को पत्थर क्यों आ रहे हैं वो अब दे बीमार था वो अब दे बी सारे मिलके वो अब दे बीमार था वो अब दे चलने से जो लाचार था चलने से जो था और शाम का बाजार था और शाम का और मुस्तफ़ा की बेटियाँ मौला हक के माम या हसन या हुसैन मौला हक के माम मौला हक के माम या हसन या हुसैन या हुसैन या हुसैन या हुसैन शबीर की वो लाडली पीर की वो लाडली सीने पे जो शह के पली सीने पे जो जिसकी अबाबन में जली जिसकी अबाब मुँह पे तमाचों के निशान मौला हक के माम या हसन या हुसैन मौला हक के माम या मौला हक के माम या हसन या हुसैन या हुसैन या हुसैन या हुसैन या हुसैन या हुसैन वो असगरे बेशीर था वो असगरे 
बेशीर था और हुर मला का तीर था और हुर मला का तीर था प्यासा गला क्यों कर कटा प्यासा गला क्यों कर कटा लर्जी जमी और रास मा मौला हक के माम या मौला हक के माम या हसन या हुसैन 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 बिसमिल्लाहमानीम अल्ला मुहमद व आल मुहमद अल्लाम कोल हजत बिन हसन सलावत क्या फिहादे सा फी कुल सालियन मुहाफाद मनासरा दलील फातिमतर سيدتي نساء العالمين السلام عليك يا ابا محمد الحسن المجتبى السلام عليك يا حسين ابن علي الشهيد بكربلاء السلام على الحسين all together السلام على الحسين وعلى عليه ابن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين خصوصا سيدي ومولاي بالفضل العباس وأختك زينة وأم كلثوم وبنتك سكينة السلام عليك علي ابن الحسين زين العابدين السلام عليك يا محمد ابن باقر علوم النبيين السلام عليك يا جعفر ابن محمد الصادق السلام عليك يا موسى ابن جعفر الكاظم السلام عليك علي ابن موسى الرضا المرتضى السلام عليك يا محمد ابن علي التقي السلام عليك يا علي ابن محمد النقي السلام عليك يا حسن ابن علي العسكري السلام عليك يا حجة القائم يا صاحب العصر والزمان سيدي الأمان 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 من فتن الزمان السلام عليك يا شريك القرآن كعبة الإيمان إمامنا وإمام الإنس والجان عجل الله تعالى فرجاك وسهل الله تعالى مخرجاك وظهور الأمر ورحمة الله وبركاته صلوات